why not? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, as I'm sure it is with uh, Rabbi Rafi Kaiserbluth, you can uh, at any stage chime in if you feel that something is, uh, um, you know, needs debating or needs discussion. I do not have all the answers, but I certainly, um, uh, I certainly we will try and have a discussion on, on something if I don't have all the answers. Um, uh, but it's a very interesting topic we're going to discuss tonight. But I thought what we'd first do is have a look at the parasha. Um, uh, just a couple of little points about the parasha that we um, that we encounter. So parasha Naso, which is the second um, in the book of Bamibar. And even though last week we, um, sorry, so we started Bimi Bar two weeks ago, but last week was the second day of Shavuot. So uh, that, le that lends itself now to carrying on with the parasha. So some trivial points and things that you can wow your friends with at parties. Um, the parashat Nassau is the single, in terms of the single parashat, it's the longest one. Um, it is, uh, it goes on for quite a while. Obviously the double parashat will, would, would, uh, would, uh, you know, overtake that in terms of the length. Um, it's got some uh, notable uh, inclusions. Probably the most well-known one is the priestly blessing um, that appears in this week's parasha. Um, and there are some quite, there are quite a few rules also pertaining to the, the, um, the Nazarite and, um, you know, the laws and the, that go around with the vows, uh, including for what's included for the Nazarites as well. However, tonight I thought we'd um, concentrate on a fairly long section, but a section which is very interesting from a um, historical, but also from a rational and even a, maybe a magical perspective. And there's a lot of conjecture around it. Uh, and you'll see as we're going along, uh, the different kind of language and the different kind of perspectives that are that are used for this um, for this uh, reading this section. So I'm going to just open up um, this thing here. What? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just going to see why. Okay, done. Okay, now. Uh, we can share screen and we're going to share that. Okay. So um, you can, can you all, can you see the screens? You can see it. Good. All right. So basically this section that we're going to study tonight is effectively called the trial of the Sota. Um, a little funny aside thing when I was typing it out, it order corrected it to trial of the South. So <laughs> may, maybe it is that who knows. Um, a sota. Does anyone before we start? Does anyone know what sota is referring to? What, who, who, or what is the sota? An unfaithful wife. Good. Who was that? Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. Wonderful. <laughs> so it's actually um, it, it relates to that, but it's not quite specific. Is that sorry, David? You. Were? I was going to say a woman who is accused of being unfaithful. More. That's exactly. Of Someone course, the lawyer. Sorry, of course. Lawyer. <laughs> um, Sorry, I was correct. Wrong. It's not. It's. It, there is a bit of a difference between uh, the unfaithful wife and the wife that is accused of being unfaithful. Now, they may end up at the same, uh, um, you know, destination, but um, that's not what the trial actually talks about. So I thought we'd have a quick read through, and this um, translation that we've got here is the one that comes from. Uh, JPS, the Eitz Chaim, if you've got that. Um, but maybe we can get a volunteer just to, it's quite a lengthy, it's a, it's, almost, it's 20 verses that we've got to read through. Uh, and it goes through what actually happens or what the Torah says about um, the trial of this uh, woman and how it, you know, how it, it plays out. So do you have any volunteers who would like to start reading? All right. I guess I'll do. <laughs> okay. So, and again, please uh, understand that when um, the language used over here, we may not necessarily use it today, but I'm going to read it as in the translation that's there. 
The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelite people and say to them, if any man's wife has gone astray and broken faith with him, in that a man has had carnal relations with her unbeknown to her husband, and she keeps secret the fact that she has defiled herself without being forced, and there is no witness against her, but a fit of jealousy overcomes him, and he is wrought up about the wife who has defiled herself, or if a fit of jealousy comes over one and he is wrought up about his wife, although she has not defiled herself, the man shall bring his wife to the priest. So here we're going to start now with what, what actually plays out. And he shall bring as an offering for her one-tenth of an ephah of barley. So an ephah is a dry measure. No oil shall be poured upon it. No frankincense shall be laid on it, for it is a meal offering of jealousy, a meal offering of remembrance which recalls wrongdoing. The priest shall bring her forward and have her stand before the Lord. The priest shall take sacral water in an, unearth in an earthen vessel and taking some of the earth that is on the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall put it into the water. After he has made the woman stand before the Lord, the priest shall bear the woman's head and place upon her hands the meal offering of remembrance, which is the meal offering of jealousy. And in the priest's hand shall be the water of bitterness that induces the spell. The priest shall adjure the woman, saying to her, If no man has lain with you, if you have not gone astray in defilement while married to your husband, be immune to harm from this water of bitterness that induces the spell. But if you have gone astray while married to your husband and have defiled yourself, if a man other than your husband has had carnal relations with you, here the priest shall administer the curse of adjuration to the woman. As the priest goes on to say to the woman, may the Lord make you a curse and an imprecation among your people as the Lord causes your thigh to sag and your belly to distend. May this water that induces the spell enter your body, causing the belly to distend and the thigh to sag. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. The priest shall put these curses down in writing and rub it off into the water of bitterness. He is to make the woman drink the water of bitterness that induces the spell so that the spell-inducing water may enter her to bring on bitterness. Then the priest shall take from the woman's hand the meal offering of jealousy, elevate the meal offering before the Lord, and present it on the altar. The priest shall scoop out of the meal offering a token part of it and turn it into smoke on the altar. Last, he shall make the woman drink the water. Once he has made her drink the water, if she has defiled herself by breaking faith with her husband, the spell-inducing water enter, her, in, enter into her to bring on bitterness, so that her belly shall distend and her thigh shall sag and the woman shall become a curse among her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and is pure, she shall be unharmed and able to retain seed. This is the ritual in cases of jealousy when a woman goes astray while married to her husband and defiles herself, or when a fit of jealousy comes over a man and he is wrought up over his wife. The woman shall be made to stand before the Lord and the priest shall carry out this ritual with her. The man shall be clear of guilt, but that woman shall suffer for her guilt. So a nice little bedtime story mm. and a very interesting one to examine. So any thoughts, any, any reflections so far? Maybe it's just the translation, but the word spell reminds me that in other parts of the Torah, um, sorcerers were put to death. Um, and thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So I'm surprised at uh, the implication that magic is allowed. Ah, okay. So we've got the term magic, which we're going to come back and explore, but it's a very interesting way to look at it. That that's a, um, the whole process does... Uh, lend itself to 
this notion of of magic there's no uh, proof of anything that the husband would bring his wife before the priest um there's no um you know there's there's, there's really just an, an allegation and and in doing in in alleging that she's done this uh lindsay you're saying that a, that a spell um this magic sort of thing can this this ritual of magic would be carried out to determine whether she actually was unfaithful or whether um it whether she wasn't and it's just his jealousy yeah well it's mumbo jumbo essentially isn't it i can uh, yeah very good i can see that i can see this playing out in an asterisk and oblix um um cartoon not mm -hmm. quite to the to the extent here, but the, certainly the the processes go there. With the mumbo jumbo, um, do you mean like the entire process, parts of it, or specific parts of it? I had the same response as um, Lindsay through the reading. You know, the the use of the word spell because it's a it's um, it's cursing it's cursing the um, perhaps. Um, unfaithful, mm -hmm. but equally, perhaps, a completely innocent party, um, cursing her and using a, um, you know, something that belongs in, as I said, mumbo jumbo voodoo um, uh, practice, you know, I mean, really primitive, beyond superstitious. Mm. Just um, and, and it's 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 a um, a curse, and I I think um, the other thing that um, uh, I know you'll be able to I'm sure you'll be able to unpack for us, um, Sam, uh, the issue of um, well it doesn't really matter you know it's it's the 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 chaps the chaps um, overwrought so. Let him have his way. Never mind. Never mind the expense to um, the uh, the woman. So, uh, if I understand correctly, the um, there is a perception that it is only the woman who uh, can potentially be um, can potentially. <coughs> Uh, well, I can't think of the right word. Have have a, a black mark against her name or anything else? So that she yes that for the man, there's no punishment. There's no repercussions. No, there are no repercussions if uh, it's generally if it's found out that the woman was not unfaithful, then he um, he is not in any way held liable. Yes, but, um, but she, she will have suffered um, yep. uh, either way and every way. Um, does the next verse, after 31, does the next verse go on to where the priest, when the woman's found innocent, the priest criticises the husband for... No. No? no. Um, mm. I haven't actually got the... Someone can have the words in front of them. As far as I know, it goes on to the vow of the Nazarite. It does. Uh, it does. Yeah. It goes on. Yeah. It but doesn't he, kill... He will be punished because she will have lost her trust in him. Ah. He's dragged her through this ordeal and shamed her and there's nothing, she's done nothing wrong, then how are they going to rebuild trust in their marriage? Correct. So there's a, there's a point about trust throughout the, the whole process and that if he suspects of, of uh, being unfaithful, um, goes through the process and is found, if, if we're going to believe what is written there, found not to have been unfaithful, then... There's a trust, there's a breakdown in, in the in the marriage relationship. Um, and, you know, now now what? Now what happens? I mean, it's all very well that, that the, um, the commentary around this says that, you know, uh, she will still be able to bear children if she's found to be unfaithful. Um, but really, she's not... Um, how is she actually going to be treated in, in, in the community and uh, never mind just by her husband, but by everybody else as well. Mm. Yeah. But going back to what Meryl said, 
in the notes in the Etz Chaim, it speaks about how this only applied to very early days in Israelite history. Yep. And even by Second Temple times, people were too cynical for this to work. Correct. Yeah. So that's a very good uh, hist well, yeah. sorry, historical, if you want to put chronological way of looking at it, that yes, this is mainly pertaining to the First Temple, um, or times of the First Temple. Um, there are a number of things that relate to it not being in Second Temple um, times. There, uh, there was, you know, the change in the way that the, the priests would, um, um, not necessarily that they would do, but what they were concerned with or what they were, what they were tasked with. Um, there's also a, um, a strong point that, that says that the, because when they talk about the, the, the earth that is there, the, the earth used in this mixture that she's going to yes. drink and the water, they're talking about um, stuff which is in the tabernacle, which is in the temple uh, grounds. So that yes. the priest is taking from the floor, is taking the dust, and he's taking water from the from the um, the basin or the altar inside the actual temple. And so there is, a, you know, even though people are saying, "Well, it's the second temple," well, actually, it's the sec it's the second temple, not the first temple. And they're um, they're you know in between the two in the exile to uh, um, to uh, Babylon that there is a, uh, you know, there's a change in the whole way that people looked at it and, and may not have wanted to carry it out. And um, more importantly, wanted to use it rather as a, uh, a warning system or a, you know, don't do this. Otherwise, we're going to be looking at this kind of thing happening. Um, you know, we, we would rather prevent it, uh, is what it's basically been said. Um, sure, though, you say that, though, the... Um, I'm going to put it out there, but the, there is an entire tractate of Talmud uh, dedicated to Sota, to the woman accused of being unfaithful. An entire tractate, like, you know, six chapters um, of Mishnah and Gemara. And while they, that you have to look at the Mishnah and say, yeah, the Mishnah is commenting on, on what's happening in, in the Torah, but the Gemara and the stories of the Mishnah carry... Um, some weight in terms of what actually was the process. So you'll find that the first, I think it's the first two chapters of Sota are commentary <clears throat> on this. Um, and then the next ones are actually sort of dealing with how you mitigate it. Uh, so that even though this wasn't really a, a, a practice carried forward into the second temple, well, not that much anyway, it still features as a whole tractate in the Talmud. Um, so, you know, it has, it has ongoing um, relevance. As, as a warning, perhaps. Um, perhaps as a warning. There are other messages that go with it, and we're going to um, a, a very them. A very patriarchal and um, misogynistic warning, that is. Uh, yes and no. I'm going to agree with you. And I'm going to say there's going to be something else we're going to discover soon. Anna. I, I said before that you, I knew you would unpack it for us. Thank you, Sam. But I'm not um, saying it's not misogynistic. I'm saying there's more than it, more than meets the eye. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, Sam, can you, so in the, the tractate, um, what do they have to say? What do the sages have to say about um, the first question as put so well by Lindsay? Um, the use of that word spell, which um, is um, rather jarring. Okay, we're going we're gonna to examine a couple of passages from the Talmud, um, one of them from Sota and one of them from Brachot, which, which refer back to this. But we're going to come to that shortly. I think somebody else, does somebody else want to say something? Anna? No. Hi, good evening, Hi. everybody. I was just having a laugh at this line so that her belly shall distend and her fat shall sag. And I'm thinking that's going to be me after birth. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, it's interesting you say that because it's quite a, um, let me find the notes, uh, the belly shall distend. I've got lots of little notes that I've uh, downloaded, but there's a, um, a reference that 
that when it says that the thigh shall descend in a belly, sorry, a belly shall descend in a thigh uh, shall sag, it's actually referring to the more from the from the, a sexual reproduction, sexual reproductive organs, rather than physically her belly. So you remember when, when this is being uh, at this stage, you'd have to look back and say, under what circumstances would a man think that his wife is being unfaithful? Well, if he's prone to jealousy and um, yes. gets wrought up, um, uh, you know, um, it doesn't, you know, all sorts of things could, um, could sure. prompt his accusations. Absolutely. So he could be a jealous person, a jealous man, and he, uh, at, the, at the mere thought of, uh, of his wife maybe going astray, he uh, undertakes or he, he enacts this, uh, this, this trial. Mm. Or there could be gossip. Um, there could be gossip, absolutely. Um, one, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that definitely is there. What about physical signs? What could think about a belly distending? Oh, she's pregnant. Uh -huh. pregnant. So, and that's another, it's not the, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's another piece in the puzzle to say that she may be pregnant and that he might be thinking, not as simply as this, wait a second, I was out of town on business then, or, 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 or saying, you know, it does tie in with the whole jealousy, uh, notion of jealousy, but that she may be pregnant and if she's pregnant and he's not sure if it's uh, his child, um, he would want to bring this, this forth. Why is it would be so important if, I mean, surely it's the mother, it's, it's still going to be their child if he didn't do anything about it, but why it would it be so important for the man to bring this forward if he suspects that his pregnant wife is carrying a child which is not his? Back at that time, it was patrilineal descent. Perfect. And in saying that, if it's not his child... He does not want someone else's um, offspring. offspring to inherit. Correct. And that, and it so again, comes down to, you know, the material wealth um, <clears throat> that is his. That it now would be going to someone who is potentially not not of his uh, lineage. And, so, and of course, those who have advocated for patrilineal descent have forgotten that this has in fact got an adverse impact on modern feminism. In that? In that the um, idea of patrilineal descent is there to protect the right of the father in, 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 in a religious sense to pass on a religious inheritance in the historical sense to pass on a physical inheritance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in both instances, it says, in effect, um, the mother is a secondary proposition in terms of that inheritance. Mm. You see it in the Book of Ruth, don't you? Yeah. 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 I was thinking that also, Shira. Mm. Yeah. The cousin or whatever he was um, that, saying, yeah, I, can't do it. I, I don't see Ruth as a very good feminist text, to be honest. Oh, sorry, the cat in amongst the pigeons. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and the, the reason for that is that although um, um, the conversation between Ruth and Naomi is a conversation between two strong women, it's, it doesn't deal with how they will then be treated by the men folk around them. Mm. Mm. And, and in order to be effective as a feminist text, it has to evoke some degree of rebalancing of gender power. Mm. Right. Yeah, I was always surprised that they were able to travel alone safely. Ruth and Naomi were apparently able to walk long distances without a man around mm. and stay safe. Yes, which you couldn't yeah, do that as well. Um, maybe uh, we can happy to maybe have a discussion about Ruth. Sorry, I brought that up. It's okay. It's all right. It's not a, a, a but it is relevant to what we're looking at you. And in terms of timing. Um, this parasha would always be read the Shabbat after Shavuot. Mm. Yes. Uh, that's just the timing thing. I don't think there's too much coincidence reading into it, but that happens to be what it is. 
I just ask what would be if if we were to reverse the, the place of the man and woman, um, how would you then ha have the story if the man was the one who was having the affair? Because where's the proof? Exactly. Who is pregnant then? There, there are no DNA tests in exactly. biblical times. There are no, um, there's, there's nothing there to, to um, say, force this upon a man. But you, there's a very interesting um, discovery we're going to make soon about why this process is in place. Um, and, and even though it does, it does lend itself to a very uh, sexist, uh, you know, not belief, but a, a ritual, it is um it does have protections in there for the woman um i won't i won't talk too much about it, but but you're right and there's no there's no reverse sort of thing to say if the woman suspects the husband of being um the wife suspects the husband of being unfaithful well that doesn't come into play here um okay now sorry i just want to make sure so just in terms of looking at the a couple of notes on the actual procedure itself um, and some, maybe some explanation notes, if we go back to 16, uh, boom, boom, boom. So it says the priest shall bring her forward and have her stand before the Lord. So basically what she's then taken to the priest in the tabernacle. So that's where it actually is going to happen. Um, uh, and then the priest will take the holy water. So he has a stand um, there and that there's this whole significance, symbolic significance um, because, but we weren't, you know, that there's all this, uh, not allegation, but there's all this sort of happening things that are surrounding this about what could have happened, what couldn't have happened. Where's this water, not where's the water coming from, but, you know, how does this whole thing play out with, gathering the dust, taking the water, writing some curses on, a, on some parchment, then, you know, mumbo jumbo doing your spell and then have the woman drink the water. And by the way, when they say bitter water, there's also a reference um, to, because they said that the, the, the by itself, in other words, the dust and the water that was there mixed on the parchment would not make it bitter. So there's, there's, you know, some, there's different theories as to using some other, um, spice or herb or something like that to make it a bitter water. So mm. It's not just in terms of the um, the bitterness of the actual allegation, it's the bitterness of the actual water itself. Um, so uh, another interesting point that we encounter is that um, at any stage, at any stage, the woman can t could turn around and say, um, I refuse to go undergo this process. Um, now, it's a bit of a strange one because how is she going to refuse? Well, um, you, can, you can see that if the woman is guilty and did not want to undertake this, then it may be in her favor not to do this. Because effectively, uh, the, the warnings that would give, well, I say warnings that would give her, the instructions or the, that the, the guidance that would give her is that, if you've done this, you don't have to undergo this process. This is not a fate complete. You can admit to having done this. And, uh, you know, obviously there, there are uh, punishments that go along with that, but we will not undertake this, uh, this trial. And where does it say that, Sam? Where does it say that? Yeah. Um, it's in the Mishnah. In the Mishnah. Okay. Yeah. So that she, um, if she doesn't want to undertake it and, and say that everything, you know, fine, I'm guilty. Um, she wouldn't have to drink that, that, that water. Then uh, thinking about that whole process that I think, I'm not sure who mentioned it might've been Merrill or um, Lindsay about there's a, this connotation afterwards. How do you build again trust within the relationship? Isn't when it's a form of coercion though, because it's, you know, you either drink a bit of water or you admit that you're wrong. No, no, no. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but from her perspective, if she actually is guilty, she uh, loses less in terms of admitting the guilt and moving on rather than being taken before the priest and made to uh, undergo this trial. Yes, but she might just then admit without actually being guilty. 
because the trial itself is is then worse than admitting. Ah, but okay, so who is going to determine in this trial? Who determines her guilt? Well, that, that's the the real question because it is not the trial process of the sota that determines the guilt. Yeah. So. Rather, this is the showpiece. That is what is presented out in public. Yep. You can well imagine that the woman will have been interviewed by the priest in advance. Um, the priest will have formed a view as to whether or not there has been infidelity. And the contents of the mixture will be adjusted accordingly. Ah, interesting. Conspiracy theory. Right. <laughs> um, the, this is a very unique set of circumstances in our Torah. It is the only one that, maybe I might be wrong, but the only one I know of where the entire process is not judged by another human being. Yes, it is alleged by the husband, and yes, um, he, will, the, he will bring his wife before the priest and there will be a ritual that goes around it. But everything in the process, everything in the actual you know, how to, what's going to happen. It says that the priest shall bring her forward and have her stand before the Lord. In other words, she's appearing before God. Yes, the priest is administering what's going to happen, but it is God's will, according to this, that is going to determine whether she is guilty or whether she is innocent. Uh, it says... Yeah, the, even the curse. May the Lord make you a curse and an imprecation upon among your people, as the Lord causes your thigh to sag and your belly to distend. Right. So everything that happens in there. It sounds like an abortion because, like, if she drinks this bit of water and then all of a sudden her her body is sagging and and whatever, is this an abortion? Like, what's going on here? It it may very well be. Um, it, I'm not sure about going to the extent of saying it's an abortion. However, there is the understanding that if she is guilty, in other words, if she's found to be guilty, she will no longer be able to produce children. Mm. She will be barren from that time onwards. Mm. So, Can I ask you, when you said before that if she was guilty, she'd be better off not going through this ceremony and admitting it, mm. but then she's breaking one of the most paramount um, commandments and admitting to it. Yep. So surely there were dire consequences for her. Well, in some cases, yes, because because adultery is punishable. It, it, it's possibly punishable by death. Yes. So yeah. but, why would you admit to that rather than go through this ceremony and hopefully get away with it? Well, asking. if the notion is that God is going to be the one deciding, there's no sort of convincing the jury otherwise. The point you just made, Sam's... Um, I think helps demonstrate that the, what is being done here is for show. That's right. Because if the punishment for adultery is to be stoned, not in the modern sense, yeah. then... <laughs> Shame. Then, <laughs> sorry. But I know what then, I heard you talking about. Then the sotar, <laughs> the sotar who is determined to be guilty would be subject to a death penalty, but that's not included here. No. So in, in one respect, what the rabbis are doing is assuming that the woman is not guilty of adultery and therefore to be subject to a death penalty. Yes. And in fact, putting her through a show to shut the bloody husband up. Yes, that's right. Mm. That's right. We're getting <laughs> on to the main reason for this being there. And, and uh, we're going to discover some lovely things as we're going to go along there. Now, I just want to make sure I've not missed anything out there um, that are important. Sorry, people. Um, uh, one of the other interesting points is that the it's the husband that provides the meal offering. In other words, he pays for the meal offering. It's the woman, the wife that presents the offering. It's almost like a payment to the priest. So he pays, she presents. It's, it, it, I think one of the things it's doing there is lending itself to a 
a joint process. This is not a matter a matter of um, allowing him to stand back and say, I have nothing to do with this. I well, he's the one who's jealous, so that's the reason they're there in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, and uh, but at the same time, I also acknowledge that um, uh, providing for a meal offering is not the same as um, having to undergo this ritual. Mm -hmm. However, there is no, it's not pure absolution for him and he just gets to stand on the side and do whatever. He's paying his way, you know, he's paying well, he's the paying legal for... fees. <laughs> yeah, yeah he's pay he, right, he's paying for legal fees. That's what he, uh, <laughs> that's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, because afterwards, sorry, Meryl, afterwards when she's found innocent and they're going home and everyone knows that they've been there and she's gone through this process, he's going to look a real fool in public. Absolutely. So his reputation is going to suffer mm. possibly more than hers. He's going to be known as an idiot. <laughs> and rightly so, Lindsay. And rightly, yeah, thank you very much, and rightly so. Um, but but um, um, uh, Sam, where did the rabbis um, get the um, uh, teaching um, suggestion that um, the woman... Uh, could actually refuse to go through it. Um, that it's, in the, it's in the Mishnah. It's in the Mishnah yeah. states that she has the uh, that uh, that she would be um, consulted. Yeah. I think David mentioned almost con uh, uh, counselled by the priest, um, and it wouldn't just be the priest, uh, the Kohen. It would be others as well to say to her, um, you know, it, it may be less embarrassing, or or you know, if you know that you're guilty, then let's go down a different path rather than. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, that's all extremely. Um, I, I like it. I like it. But um, it's conjecture until oh, yeah. we find out um, uh, on what um, the uh, the sages um, based that um, that uh, splendidly fair um, arrangement discussion. You're talking about the actual process, or about the. No, no. Uh, the almost coercion thing. If you're guilty, her ability to say, "I'm not going to go through this." So, yes. so let me just see what the notes that I had on here. Um, because in the track date, they must have some um, uh, sort of um, source for that. Um, Right. I'd have to, I would, to be honest, I'd, I'd actually have to look that up. You probably are right. And I'm happy to take that as homework yeah. um, and to find. Um, I'm just really pleased to hear that somebody in the second century or thereabouts um, realized that yeah. um, it was that possibility. So, yes. So let's, let's move on. Okay. So someone asked about what references there are in the Talmud. And so before we get onto that, this is uh, from the Rambam's um, Guide for the Perplexed, a uh, medieval writing for um, those who want the Torah interpreted in a um, less studious, less scholarly way. So he says that there are frequently occasions for suspicion of adultery and doubts concerning the conduct of the wife. Laws concerning a wife of adultery, the Sota, are therefore prescribed, and the numbers five is what we just read, the effect of which is that the wife, out of fear of the bitter waters, is most careful to prevent any ill feeling on the part of her husband against her. Even of those that felt quite innocent and safe were most, safe most, were rather willing to lose all their property than to submit to the prescribed treatment. Even death was preferred to the public disgrace of the uncovering of the head, undoing the hair, rending the garments and exposing the heart and being led through the sanctuary in the presence of all, of all women and men, and also in the presence of the members of the Sanhedrin. The fear of this trial keeps away diseases that ruin the home comfort. Does that answer your... Uh, your... That's Maimonides speaking. Uh, yes. Yeah. So it's a, yes, it's a, a commentary on it and it may you know there obviously there would be i'm sure that many people looking at this and going um again where's the where's the um 
where, where's the consequence here for the man if if this is not all uh, taken the right way, or if it's you know if it, if it proves to be um, that the you know because he's not going to be exposed in the trial. He's presenting a uh, a meal offering, and he's going to sit on the side and watch. And be standing. No, it's not quite that simple. No. He he the 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 husband has made the accusation. If this go trial proceeds, you could well imagine that the priest would commence with, um, um, uh, just to pick the names, Sarah is here to be tried as a sotar on the accusation of her husband Abraham. He is over there. Yeah. Now assume that she drinks this yucky stuff and. Um, it tastes bad, but that's about it. And she walks away, although she's had an excessive haircut. The yep. entire community is going to look at Abraham and say, you're a bloody sod, mate. And he's going to be in all sorts of social dislocation from there. In a male-dominated... Sorry, carry on, David. Well, it, it, yes, it's a male-dominated society, but yes, everyone's going to be saying, this is the bloke who wrongly accused his wife. I'm not sure this is going to happen all that often. Ah, another interesting point. Because I... remember that all laws are created for social control. And in this case, the social control is of the men as well as of the women. There is, to my knowledge, no written record of this being carried out. Well, now we're getting some good news. Okay. Well, so. Yeah. If you're talking about, you know, what are the practicalities around this? Well, it may be, and there's one thing that speaks about it being a response to what other cultures were doing at the same time, and sadly, what other cultures, what some cultures still do today. Right. Right. So other Middle Eastern cultures may have. Uh, they may be in a situation where they would say, if a husband suspects his wife of uh, of uh, adultery, he takes matters into his own hands and he deals with the matter and that's it. And that can be a range of consequences that, you know, who knows what, uh, what doesn't, you know, who knows where the limits are. I don't think there are any limits. But I also yeah. like the comment from, there's a comment from Hirsch in the notes. Yeah. And Hirsch says, only if the husband has never been guilty of an unchastity can he impose this ordeal on his wife. So mm -hmm. he has to be innocent too. He can't behave immorally and get away with it. That's well, what that answers that's the way that is in the question text. earlier on. Um, so it, it, coming back to what I was saying about the you know reaction to other cultures at the same time or other practices at the same time. This whole um, ritual uh, is written in such a way that if it were to be that, um, that they're saying, you know, if you, if you suspect this of going on, uh, you know, this is what's happening, do not take the law into your own hands. Do not uh, be judge, jury, and executioner. This is what you need to do. Go before the priest, do this, so that in some way, and I know this is going to be, sound very ironic, it is for the protection of the woman. Rather than honour killings. Rather than an honour killing or, yeah. you know, anything else that could possibly happen. Yeah. So that the woman is then brought before an impartial party, and how can you say that God is not an impartial party, and will uh, be dealt with under that system uh, rather than, um, you know, an honour killing or anything else for that, for that matter that... Um, that uh, may happen. There are there are other couple couple of other points as well, which are which are interesting to note because it's not just a matter of and this we see a lot in um, biblical not punishment but trials uh, and that um, this is the same by the way f as far as I know for any murder cases that in order for him to be able to bring her before this uh, in order to do this trial he has to. The husband has to have told his wife, you want, I mean, it, it's probably implicit in, in, in the marriage uh, relationship, but he has to have told her, you are not to be sleeping with anybody else, right? He has to do that in front of 
two wit well, he has to do it audibly to two witnesses. What do you yeah. mean, Sam? Isn't that part of the marriage contract? Sure, but remember what they're trying to do here. They're trying to make sure this doesn't come into come into effect. So, so are you saying that before this ceremony, he had to? I don't understand when that died. Somewhere along the line, in terms of when after they were married and before he thinks this is going to happen, he has to have warned his wife, you're not allowed to do this. What so happens if she's guilty? Hmm? What happens to her if she's guilty? There are a number of uh, consequences, uh, possibly even death. Mm -hmm. As David said earlier on, not the kind of stoning we know today. I'm, I'm just, Sam, looking at um, one of the comments in the Etz Haim Humay, yeah. which uh, I'll just read it. For the sake of peace between husband and wife, God has ordered that the divine name be blotted out, the divine name having been written on the piece of paper that's dissolved. Yeah. And that the, the proposition put here is that peace is considered to be one of God's names and the re-establishment of peace between the couple replaces the effaced name. In other words, the purpose of the exercise is to re-establish peace between the couple, but I think more powerfully, because as you say, it hasn't been done, to prevent couples from airing their distrust publicly. Yep. Now that's got a plus and a minus. The, the plus is it does create some social control. The minus is it, it removes an outlet that would otherwise result in domestic violence. And I could just imagine husbands taking these matters into their own hands to avoid the public show trial. And that's what it's trying to prevent in terms of saying, if you suspect this of going on, do not take the matter into your own hands. Correct. But what, what, what I'm seeing is if you, if you think through the social control aspect in a funny way, it would get the opposite result. But then the husband would be guilty of not following this process. Correct. And, and where is the penalty for that? Not, in, not mentioned. No, not mentioned. So we're back to social opprobrium again. Yeah. Mm. It's not very... Much of, much of it is. Both outcomes aren't very good, though. Like, if she's guilty, she gets killed. And if he's guilty, he gets shamed. It's horrible on both sides. Oh, that, that was my earlier point about not being a useful feminist text. If he's guilty of adultery, you don't mean Anna, because if he's... no, I mean if he's just guilty of the fact that she's not hasn't committed. Oh, I see. Like that he's no, if, if she's innocent, if yeah. she's innocent, then mm. he's just shamed in the community mm. to an ex extent, probably because he's married, probably can get away with it anyway. Mm. But um, so yeah. just to extend out what I was saying before about the two witnesses, there's also has to be, and this we find in capital cases as well, two other witnesses that um, suspect her of doing the same thing. It almost that they have to be eyewitnesses. Okay, so, oh, oh, I see. So we, we, we're only dealing with exhibitionism, are we? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pretty much. Is that the death penalty too if, he, if he's committed uh, adultery? Or is that committed a adultery, yeah. Adultery. If you if you're guilty of adultery, it is a death penalty. Be you man or woman. Wow, it's horrible. It is. But at the end of the day, yeah, I'm look at what they're trying to do. They're trying to prevent things from happening. Sure, but are, are these marriages? These aren't love marriages. These are arranged marriages. I wasn't there, but I'm assuming. <laughs> I mean, it still happens today, right? In the very religious community, it's arranged marriage. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure these would be arranged marriages. I mean, it's not about happen. predominantly. <laughs> Yeah, predominantly if we're talking about the first temple period, so everything up to 586 BCE, you know, those couple hundred years. But it's, um, you know, think about those times and think about the, the types of marriages that would be, be happening there. And, um, you know, it's interesting that Rambam says this whole thing about the, the fear of the bitter waters, you know, maybe that you'll actually turn around and say, I don't want the disgrace, you know, uh, I am guilty, just just deal with me now but before that she's um she's just living every day in fear of um 
you know, th it, this is part of the arranged um, marriage also, that the wife, out of fear of the bitter waters, is most careful all the time to prevent any ill feeling on the part of her husband against I, I don't think that's because of the arranged marriage, Meryl. No, no, but, um, it's because of the um, the social um, mores that um, you know if 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 she um, steps out of line in any way, mm. um, it could cause um, this situation to mm. blow up. So she's always got to be mm. on her guard, in living in fear mm. of. But Maimonides uh, thinks that's a good thing. Hmm? Maimonides thinks that's a good thing. I don't think he's saying that. Um, it, well, it's... Oh, it, it is. He's saying this, this, like this is the way to avoid this problem, so it's a way of making... The fear her, of the smile keeps away, keeps away great diseases that ruin right, the heart. Keeps her on her toes. Yeah. He's saying it's good, Meryl. Yeah. Um... Yeah, but it's it's um, well. I suppose it's a it's a modern view that um, you know no human being should be um, living just in fear. Yeah. Um, but but that, I, I admit that that's a modern um, thing. But that's there, there, yeah. Sorry. There might have been other um, aspects that might have tempered that if she was from if they were a wealthy couple and she had her own money and her own property. Oh, we d I mean, I don't know if she did. I, I don't think that would Women be. did not have their own property at that time. Oh, okay. Um, Just a thought, because not at that yeah, time. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it would have, uh, you know, there'll be very rare cases of that. And I think for the majority, I don't think there'll be any cases that no. would be mentioned here where the wife would have the property and the husband would be not at that trophy husband, as they say. It's just an extension of the basic um, setup, which was that, and it was in common law, right, as David um, would know far better than I do, um, right through to about the 19th century, um, the wife was um, a good and a chattel. So Probably this is just this is just an extension of the. Um, property aspect of um, the relationship between well, a husband and a wife. Interesting you should say that because, in effect, the ketubah, the traditional marriage document in Judaism, mm. is uh, a marriage of ownership. Uh, sorry, it's, a, it's, a, it's an agreement of ownership um, mm. that the husband would pay X amount of money or uh, silver or gold um, to the father of the bride that he would pay her. And it's always worded in such a way that he has the responsibility to look after her. Mm. But in effect, it is an acquisition. The ketubah is, a, the, the traditional ketubah is a, 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 an agreement of acquisition. Except, Sam, the ketubah belongs to the woman. Yeah. But it, it, if, if, the, if they want, if... Um, if they are gonna go to divorce, actually, it's a discussion I was having with a studies of religion uh, student the other day, uh, other week. Um, if they want to get divorced, it is the husband sure. who has to give the permission for the sure. divorce. They're good now. Yeah. She That's can't right. Divorce anything. It's still. Yeah. Uh, it's transactional. Correct. He holds. He holds the the power in that in that. Uh, in that yeah. It's not covenantal. It's transactional. So um, one of the other uh, discussions that goes on, and I don't know if I've got it here or... Do, 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 do. Sorry, I'm just looking to see if it's over here. Um, one of the other discussions that goes on is this whole thing about the magical approach, and that's what, what I think Lindsay yes. was talking about right at the beginning. Mm. And that the magical, because this whole thing does sound like mumbo jumbo, that you come over here, you go boom, 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 boom. Uh, <laughs> you know, other, other, they talk about other cultures, what the, some of their... Um, their practices were there would be like that she would have to jump into this water and swim a certain distance or put her hand into boiling water or they would you know these are all magical concoctions as you come up and, and this doesn't sound any less magical than the rest of them 
this doesn't like say, oh no, hang on, because it does this or that. By many of the commentators say, commentators say that by throwing God into the actual equation, so it's not the priest administering, the priest is simply the agent to say, here's the, here's the dust, here's the water, here's the parchment, I'll write it down, you do this. The priest is doing God's work. And they say that by throwing God into the equation, it removes the notion of this is all just a magical, you know, um, you know, 12, uh, 12 tasks of, uh, of Hercules thing. Mm. 10 tasks of Hercules, I should say. Um, there's, again, a lot of approach. And remembering this is relevant to the cultures that were around at that time. But a lot of, uh, what do they call it, theurgic. So it's basically an approach trying to persuade um, the deity to do something or not do something. So there's, again, this, this thought process going on there. Um, there is a, boom, 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 the witnesses I mentioned. Ah, interesting point, point that came up that um, in the sense over here, uh, this part we're going to read now, it's actually very similar to how the golem is traditionally seen as being formed. Does anyone know what I'm talking about with the golem? Uh, yeah. Like yes. a little magical creature that, that is supposed to be, have these magic powers that are given to the golem that it's formed out of mud. It's formed out of the dust and the water, which is the same mm. component. Um, mm. And it's quite an interesting concept that a little, uh, little creature or could be a big creature, um, you know, the has these, has these magic powers taken almost from the same, not taken from, but uh, aligning to the same sort of process. Um, I don't, I think this one we've kind of covered. I'm just gonna make sure there's nothing I've left out here. But I'm sorry. Right. And, and this part about I am, but dust and ashes is what's used as the basis for, um, the golem. They, uh, even to say that Adam in his first hours of, uh, being created was a golem. People in the times of the Mishnah and Gemara must have been smoking that, stoning weed that David might have been referring to. Okay, you've got to see some of the stuff as, you know, where are they going with this? Mm. Um, this is a part here, this comes from the Talmud Bavli, from the Babylonian Talmud, from the Masechet Brachot, the tractor of Brachot. And it says, said Rabbi Elias, Elazar, Hannah, meaning Samuel's mother, <clears throat> said before the Holy One, Master of the Universe, if you take note of my suffering and grant me a child, great. But if not, then you will see. I will go and seclude myself with another man in front of my husband, Elkanah. And when I seclude myself, they will give me to drink the water of the Sotah. And you will not belie your Torah, for it is stated with regard to an innocent woman who drinks the Sotah water. Then shall, she shall be proven innocent and she shall be a seed. So is, um, first of all, how would Rabbi Elazar know what? And I was saying, I thought it was silent prayer in the first instance. Yeah, they all had their own, you know, these rabbis of the Talmud, they're not, they're not too different from the rabbis of today. Everyone's got an opinion. Yes, but what's he actually saying? That she will still be innocent because she will not, it's yeah, just the threat saying, which she's not acting on. Is correct. That? He's saying, God, um, I'm suffering. I need, you, I need you to grant, you know, help me get a child. If you don't, then I'm going to go and um, seclude my, sorry, no, let's go sleep with another man in front of my husband. In other words, I'm going to uh, almost enact the trial of the, the Sota um, um, notion, because she's basically saying that that she's going to give him, give him reason to to bring her, if, the, if, the, if it were still in play, um, to the trial, to the priest, right? Um, and then they will give me the, to drink the water of the sotar. And by the way, when they do that, you're going to basically make sure that it comes up that I'm innocent, not guilty. Because it's your fault. For... Yeah, it's your fault. Remember, it's all said in the name of this guy over here, Rabbi Elazar. Yeah. You know, again, saying what they thought might have happened there and then. 
Um, those are the only notes I had on there. I just want to see if I've got other. There's there's so much else that this these texts um, go into and that uh, that discussion that comes out of it. And it's just a. Sorry, can you sorry, um, Sam? Can you explain yeah. that? I don't quite understand. So is she can't. Hmm? I don't quite understand this. Right. So in ordinary circumstances, if we're going to look at the trial of the sota, uh, if she were to go. Uh, so she can't have a child, right? And she's asking for God's help to have a child. And she's saying, sorry, before before we get to what she's saying, ordinarily, if her husband were to suspect that she had been um, sleeping with another man, she would be brought, brought before the priest and this trial would take place. And what would happen because she'd been sleeping there? She would, her belly would ex distend and the, the thigh would grow and fall off or whatever it has to happen. And it's kind of like saying you're guilty. That's the the the, the um, you're guilty of, of adultery. She's saying, if you're not going to well, sorry, Rabbi El Azar is saying that she's saying, if you you know if you don't give me a child, you know if you're not going to help me to fall pregnant, I'm going to go and seclude myself. And I'm going to sleep with another man with the knowledge of I don't I think in front of my husband, meaning with the knowledge of uh, El Kana. And when I do so. Because he's going to say, "Well, you are, you have actually been uh, sleeping with another man." You're going to take you to the trial. Of, we're going to take you to the priest and go through the trial. And when that happens, when I drink the water, I won't be proved. I won't be shown to be guilty. All right. So, so she's saying that you will make it happen that I will be uh, regarded as an innocent woman, not a guilty woman. And of course, that's got other implications in terms of the, the social, uh, you know, social aspect that you say, well, hang on, the, the husband knew she was, you know, she's got the proof that he's that she was guilty, goes before the, 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 pre, the priest brings her before God, and God shows that she's innocent. What does that say about society? Anyone can do anything they want to. So she's, Rabbi Lazar is saying that Hannah is the one demanding of God, fix it up, or I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a big scene here. Mm. Mm -hmm. Strong woman. <laughs> I think they're all, uh, you know what, in a, in this in this uh, weird uh, in, in a weird way, they all had to be you mm -hmm. know, the, the ones that weren't would have been yeah run over. And on that on that note, actually, we'll mention to you a, a good plug for a a book um, that I'd read by one of my favorite authors. Actually, I, I spoke about this a couple of uh, years ago in Yom Kippur. Um, I've forgotten his bloody name. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the the it's a book called Adam and Eve: The First First Love, and it goes about looking at some of these stories and some of the the whole way that when the Torah was written and still even till very recently, it's all been done from a very male dominated perspective and that how things could change and how it could be said to be different or even shown to be different by simply putting a more egalitarian um, set of spectacles on mm. um, in terms of doing that. And I, I cannot believe I've forgotten the guy's name. Uh, Bruce Fair. Okay. He's uh, he writes other good books as well, but that's just a side note, and I, I'm not getting any commission from him. So just so you know. <laughs> how do you know. spell his? How do you spell his family uh, name? E I L E R or F E I double L E R. Okay. Thank you. Actually, I'll tell you what I'll do is I will try and find you something over here. Um, <clears throat> all right, any other comments, any other, um, uh, questions, thoughts? No? Would this have happened in a time when the husband had more than one wife? Very possibly. Um, that is very possible, it would have. Mm. Um, I'm just going to do this. Thank you very much, Sam.
Not a problem. I just want to quickly show you that. Um, here, here. Okay. First love story. There you go. Oh, my. <laughs> Bruce Sailor. And there's the man himself, and I have a picture with him. There you go. He has an interesting, he has his own interesting story about, uh, about his life as well. Very interesting man. Hmm. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. No problem at all. Thank you. I've enjoyed this. I, uh, I hope that uh, you've got something out of this and uh, I enjoyed the discussion and thank you for participating. Uh, all great. compliments can be sent to, to the, the Board of Emmanuel Synagogue. All complaints. <laughs> thank you, Sam. I enjoyed thank it you. very much. Have a good thank week, you. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Good luck. Thank and you, everybody. Have a good week. Much yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.